Hello and welcome to The Review, a brand new concept in fishing videos with me, Tom Scully, and my good mate, Dave Roberts. So what's this about? Well, Dave and I are both unsponsored anglers, um, so we're free to use whatever tackle we want. So the crux of the idea is we're going to go out on the bank, look at different items of tackle, different venues, different tackle shops, and give you our honest feedback. Tom and myself, we fish so many different venues and use so many different pieces of equipment. So we feel we can offer a genuine and honest review on so many products. And it's fair to say, we don't agree on everything, do we? Not at all. So we're gonna really sort of thrash these products out and really give a genuine review on any products that we use. So whatever we like, whatever we dislike, you'll get to find out. And Dave, we've got some pretty exciting products to kick off with today, haven't we? To start with, we are gonna have a look at the Guru Aventis feeder rods which I know you've used, but I haven't. Uh, and then we're gonna look at the Preston Innovations Extremity Reels, which I've used, but you haven't. And we're gonna look at the Octbox seat box system, which again, a lot of anglers are starting to use. I've not actually sat on one myself, and um, we're gonna have a look at those. We've also got a, a big debate coming your way today, folks, about ground bait. And again, this is something we have very different views on, isn't it? Um, so that's gonna be really interesting. I'll look at different mixers that Dave uses and I use uh, when it comes to natural venue fishing. We're at the lovely Docklow Pools today uh, near Hereford. Absolutely stunning setting as you can see, lovely lakes and great facilities. About a 15 mile drive away from Hereford, but we're not actually fishing today at Docklow, are we Dave? No, but we're gonna have a breakfast. Oh yes. And uh, we're gonna use the facilities here. It's a wonderful place here and it's, uh, it's a real step into the countryside this is. You, you could be, uh, you could be anywhere. You could be in Alaska or anywhere, couldn't you? It's just the most beautiful setting. This time setting. you could be in Alaska, definitely. Well, yes, it's a bit cold, which is why <laughs> I think we should go and get some breakfast. Absolutely. Do you want to do that now? Let's go. Here we are. We are. The River Y. Bit of water on today. Yeah, well, this is why I brought you here. It was, uh, you know, we wanted to give these rods a good test, so uh, there's no bigger test than this. You've got uh, about five foot of extra cold water coming into the river, leaves, everything, all the autumnal debris washing in, so it's as good a test for a rod as any. You say as, as good a test as a rod for any. I don't think I've ever seen a rod. Um, put through such an extreme test. A five ounce feeder on there, 140 grams. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, for this sort of fishing, I have a theory that you put five ounces on and wherever that holds, that's where you fish. But you've got to be able to cast that five ounces out. And um, it's not so much of a cast, it's more of a lob. You're lobbing five ounces out into the river, you know, and um, uh, that's, that's where the, you know, the rod needs that sort of bit of backbone to be able to get that out there. Okay, I'm just going to give... Um a bit of background on this rod. Obviously the Guru Aventus range of rods, massively popular, launched last year. Um, you could say really Guru had its origins in a commercial um, background in terms of commercial fishing and the commercial rods in this range have been very popular, 10 and 11 foot feeder rods mm -hmm. and, and float rods as well. Um, the 13 foot version of this rod is um, branded a distance feeder mm -hmm. tool. Um, it's obviously for casting quite a long way, as the name suggests. I know there's a few features of the um, rod that are made for that. A longer handle is one example. Um, that's to help you cast further. The grips uh, on the base of the neoprene there, they're purpose-made 
to help you get hold of them. Mm. Bigger eyes and something called Zero 090 um, action or, or weave in the carbon, which um, again is designed to give you a bit more power mm. on the cast. But essentially when it comes to a good river rod, what you're looking for on this sort of venue, I don't suppose any of that's that important, is it? Well, it's not, but the, the, the qualities that make it a good distance casting rod can make it a good river rod as well. Mm. Um, you know, that you've, it's got to have that sort of, that action that allows you to punch feeders a long way. And like I was saying with this, with heavy feeders, you know, la you know la launching those, uh, and then obviously the action to be able to, to bring that back, hopefully with a, an angry barbel on the end. So it, it, the, the qualities are, are not dissimilar, and things like the long handle, well, you see, this is the way I fish on the river. I always fish with the rod in my lap. I know we, we live in an era where it's very much the vogue not to do that and to have it on rest, but I find on the river, you know, there's so much going on that it pays to have the rod there, and also, you can, you'd be surprised what you can feel through a rod, and if you do get a vicious drop back, I can feel that. So, but the length of that handle sits it nice there. It's just the perfect thing. If I had a short handle, then the reel would be here, the rod would be let, for, you know, uh, further down the rod rest and maybe not sitting quite so comfortably. So there's lots of qualities there that cross over in, into big river fishing and, and long distance feeder fishing. So, Okay, I want to um, hit you with a question then. First impressions, what do you think of it? I like it. It's, I mean, it's obviously been well thought out. Um, it's, you know, and there's, it's the little things, isn't it, that make the difference, you know, the, like, the, like the real seat. And I like this, this screw handle, screw down handle, as opposed to the old fashion collar that sort of tightens up but I just feel that's so much neater um, you've got your your, your hook clip here um, and, and everything just sort of it, it looks it's very easy on the eye you know it's a nice rod to you know you pick it up and you look at it and it I looks think that's uh, one thing with Guru as a brand I mean I've got to say they are a sexy brand they they do the best to make it like that you know I've sort of struggled to get on with some of the clothing because it's obviously made for young, slim, sexy guys. The, uh, the yeah. hoodies are very tight fitting, which is a bit small for me. To I, I get away with it, but I can see, <laughs> I can, I can feel your pain. Right. Um, <laughs> but, but it, it's, um, but no, that's I, I do. They do things well, and and I think aesthetically, it's very pleasing. And and so far, it's it, you know it's cast eight five ounces of feeder. We're holding bottom. Um, all we need now is a barbel to really uh, to really test it, or a big chub or something. I want to just pick your brains a little bit about the action, top end of the rod, when it comes to feeder fish. I mean, this, what we're doing today, is a little bit different to, you might say, lighter feeder fishing on rivers, where you might be looking for dropbacks off roach or skimmers, or and I suppose when that drops back or goes round, the fish is on, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. But one thing I've sort of struggled with, with other rods, when it comes to taking a big long rod, I say a long rod, a 12 or 13 foot feeder or onto a river, is you'd often find the whole bloody rod bends round, mm. not just the tip. Mm. I used this rod on the River Yare yeah. earlier this year, um, feeder fishing quite a way out, probably a 40 or 50 yard cast, catching bream, skimmers, roach. And I love the fact that it was a, a tip action. Mm. And even today when we know we're really sort of taking it to the, um, to the extreme really with the size of feeder we're fishing um, and the weight of feeder, it's still sort of all right, the tips bent, but mid action is still fairly stiff. Do you think that's important? Yeah, I mean, you, you, we're going to be fishing, you know, any bites we get really are going to be like a quite a, you know, it's going to be quite an, a, an aggressive drop back or something like that. Mm. So it's not going to be, there's not going to be any mistakes in the bite we get. So the tip, you know, uh, the tip bending over is what I want. And I want to be able to look down the rod. I don't want it going sideways or, you know, going with the mm. flow. I want it to go where the line is entering the water. That's where I want that rod tip to be bending over so I'm looking straight down the rod and like you say with other rods you have they have a tendency to sort of collapse over and especially this time of year, you've got so many leaves and so, so much building up on the line so um, yeah it doesn't do that it sort of sits you know it seems to hold its own in that flow and uh, I'm quite happy with what I've seen so far. Just a, a quick question though. I asked you what size tip you'd use today normally obviously I know you use tricast rods for a lot of this kind of fish and you told me four ounce tip now the heaviest that this rod is supplied with is a three ounce um, fish on or no? No, I think that's just moved in the foot. Oh, um, <coughs> but do you do you feel that that tip's doing the job? It's heavy enough. Yeah, because like I say, you, you're fishing for, you know, no, even if I had a, a five ounce tip or something like that, it would still be bending over. Yeah. And I actually find I tend to choose um, a lighter tip um, than a, the perhaps I would need because I want that rod bent over and I want to see. A reaction when I get a bite so having as long as the, the whole rod doesn't bend with it and I find the tip doesn't you know if, if the blank is good which this is it's you know it's all incorporated there's no flat spot so it sort of cushions into the bow that you you know we're casting out five ounces 
letting it hit the bottom, peeling out a big bow of line, and then we're sort of running down into that, you know, our tip's bending over into that bow. And that, you know, it's like a cushion. If, if you had a real stiff rod, you'd lose some of that, and it would bounce the feeder around. So I think that you, you need that bend in the tip, and whatever rod you're using, and, not, and however extreme in these conditions, I want to bend in the rod. Okay, so, so far, so good. It's uh, full marks from you. Can we see if we can catch a barbel on it? Yes, we are. Now we're going, everything's big today because we're, uh, we've got a big river and you can see this is what we're faced with, lots of leaves and lots of debris coming down. So it's a case of, you know, a big 140 gram feeder, whatever that is in ounces. Five ounces, I just Googled it, I just done that. Five ounces, there you go, seeing old money. So, um, you know, that's not, that's not an easy weight to cast out, you know, so a long hook length as well. Um, which is again can be troublesome so but this rod seems to handle you know I say it's more of a lob than a cast but it's just a, it's still going through your action and then just a nice gentle lob and that's going out there I'm actually having to stop that because it was going too far and it's you know that's five ounces that's just flowing through the air so there's absolutely no problem as you would expect maybe with a distance rod you know it's uh, I think it's rated to 150 grams it's casting weight is 150 grams so we've got 140 gram feeder plus ground bait so I think it's obviously more than capable of, of handling that weight to cast out the question is now is what happens when we get a fish on let's just talk very briefly then about your approach today what what term I've got to start by bigging you up a bit, I'm afraid. Um, I don't mind I that, Tom. If you, it, it, no, I don't like to talk about it, Tom, but if you want to big me up, we can, all right? I reckon you are the most, well, along with Rory Jones, I'd have to say, between the two of you, the most informed men on the, the River Wye over the last couple of years. You, you've won, is it your last four matches on the trot on here, all 80 peg plus or so? Yeah, like we've that. won um, two, two of the major titles on the River, the Wye Championships and the Ch Charity Shield, which... Um, that's never been done before. No one's won those in the same season. And um, also won a round of the Winter League and also won the Riverfest qualifier on the river, all in the space of five weeks or something like that. So it's been a pretty good uh, little period and um, I'm, I'm enjoying it and I'm, I'm as surprised as anyone. <laughs> but uh, you just sometimes, everything, the stars align and I've had one of those little purple patches and I'm just enjoying it and yeah, I'm sure it won't last forever. So I'm going to uh, enjoy it while it does. So based on that record or with that record in mind how do we approach the barbel fishing on here what are we what are we doing today to give ourselves the best chance of catching on what really is an out of sorts river yeah I, I think really it's about it's about being in control of everything so when the river's like this it's gone cold so the fish have a natural tendency to just slow down everything so i think you need to just make sure everything's as still as it possibly can be you know it's like um i liken it to like fishing you know like big reservoirs if you're fishing in windy conditions yeah. in windy conditions you're always trying to keep everything still and it's the same with flooded conditions you're trying to keep everything still so as you're giving those fish chance to see your bait and if you're fishing for roach or dace it would be the same you'd be fishing flat floats and smaller floats and uh, bigger floats to, to to really sort of slow everything down and that's why i'm fishing a big heavy feeder so i can just i know i might only get a couple of minutes out there with the amount of debris that's coming down but at least it's still for that two minutes not bouncing around and it's actually putting your bait in one place and using the big cage feeder is putting a trail of bait for them to find to come and find and in terms of terminal tackle, obviously, no nonsense hooks, line, etc. Yeah, 10 pound main line, you know, an 0, 021 hook length and a size 10, size 10 barb hook, you know, with five or six maggots on it. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 you can see the colour of the water, the flow and everything. You're going you're gonna to gain nothing by going small, you know. Yeah. Go yeah. big or go home. That's what they say, <laughs> isn't it? Sounds good to me. Yeah. As you say, when we get one, there'll be no mistake in it, I shouldn't imagine. No, it'll, um, I say, I would expect a, a, a pure drop back. Um, it's not always the way, but there's certainly going to be no, no finicky bites or shall I hit it. It'll be all or nothing. So, how long does it normally take, Dave, for you to get a bite after the cast on a day like this? Usually with this sort of method, it's usually quite, when? quite instant, <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> that was a proper bite as well, wasn't it? I saw the rod move about there. There wasn't any mistake in that, was there? <laughs> Watching the tip, I saw the rod move halfway down. So now this is, this is a bit, because we've got so much weed on the line and stuff, mm. uh, and leaves, it's hard to know how big the fish is, whether it's a chub or a barbel at this stage. I'd say my first instinct is barbel, because it's really holding in the current. 
worth saying. I mean, I'm looking at your gear. That's locked out. The rod's locked out. The line. I mean, there's so much pressure on that, but yeah. it still but looks not... like you've got a bit of action. Yeah, it? I'm not. I'm in control. If I wanted to pull harder, I could pull harder. It's just now because we've got so much water on. It's a case of getting. I try and get the barbels. Keep the barbel low if it's a barbel. Yeah. You know, keep the rod low, and then you're not trying to pull the barbel off the bottom. You just working it quite interesting so i've always been sort of taught as a young man like, get the rod get the fish off the bottom well in this condition you don't do that it's just barbel because look at the way they're built you know look at where their mouth is they want to be on the bottom yeah it's their most natural position so if you're if you've got them hooked and you're not trying to pull them off the bottom they'll generally just come along you know this one's coming up the inside now he's not giving me too much hassle and he's kind of going along with what i'm doing you know he's not arguing at the moment and it will when i get it under the rod tip but for now, it's just we're just bringing it back, nice and steady. Thoughts on the action of the rod then? Right. Okay. So that to me is doing a job. It's you know the, the rod's not you know it's still got bend in it and it's 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 got that sort of bounce you know so I can. There's more there if if, if I wanted to. The danger is with barbel is that if your rod is too stiff, that when they nod their head they'll break you know you break your line. They're a powerful fish. I always want a little bit of bend left in the rod and it's that's the key is is having the right amount of bend without without sort of jeopardizing the the way you're playing fish mm. and you don't want obviously the fish to lead you a merry dance yeah i'm quite sort of surprised given the weight of the feeder and the amount of line you've got out in the bow there you still how bloody hard that one pulled yeah they do i mean you know i suppose they've got to be they're pretty strong fish aren't they barbels yeah to survive in that sort of flow yeah. It shows they still want to feed in this flow. You know, it's, they're not scared of a bit of extra water. Okay, and, uh, so what do you think of the rod? How's it handling what you're chucking at it? Well, you can see it's fine. I mean, I've got a five ounce feeder on there. I've got a, a barbel. All right, not the biggest barbel, but a barbel all the same pulling. And it's, you can see the rod's not, not, not folding over. It's not too bouncy. It's, yeah. You know, I've got the, the fish is under the rod tip now and it's under control. I feel like it's nearly ready. There you go, fish coming up. There it is, look. And in the net. Bloody lovely barbel mm -hmm. number one. It's not bad that you know that's that's been you know that's been in control. So we've got five foot of extra water on here, five eighths of lead. It's easy enough, isn't it? And I can't see, you know, I mean it's not the biggest barbel in the world, but I wouldn't have thought a five or six pounder would have been, you know, much much uh, much more of a problem. That well, just, how big uh, is it that? Four pounds? That's four pounds, that is. Must be, yeah. Will you give me four pounds for that? I'm gonna give you three pounds fourteen for that one, mm, mate. Yes. Not that I'm competitive, but I can assure you I'm gonna catch one bigger. It's not competition it's been a tight northerner that's <laughs> tight northerner lovely oh, yeah. lovely condition fish as well yeah, yeah. beautiful there we go so look out of there let's have a little look at him you're assuming it's a him are you well it looks like a man doesn't it a thing of beauty like that could very well be female it could be look at the fins on it oh well then mate a torpedo and the thoughts on the rod yeah fantastic really good awesome i think it's my really turn good. now isn't it well, if you have to, I suppose. Let's have a go. Where are we are then, Tom? You've kicked me off the box because you've seen me catch a fish. And now you're into one yourself. Does it feel like a barbel? I don't know, Dave. It's, it's, it's large. You know, it's a bit bigger than what I caught at the weekend on the okay. Loughborough Canal. Let me put it like that. It's all right, oh, it's don't like it up it. No, they don't like it up them. So what you've got there on there, we've got the Preston Extremity Reel. Okay. Yeah. Now, as the name suggests, oh, nice barbel. It's uh, designed for extreme distance fishing. Yeah. Uh, probably bream fishing in all fairness, but those same qualities lend it well to this sort of big river fishing um you know we're chucking five ounces of lead around we've got an angry little barbel on the end he is angry isn't he yeah and um it seems to handle it quite well oh definitely it um i think the thing is with reels i've, I've got to be 100 percent honest with you dave in the past i've pinned my faith in two brands for good quality match fishing reels to me Daiwa and shimano will really the only two brands to um, to look at. Mm. I've got to say, David, that's a bit bigger than yours. I don't know. We'll put it to the judges later. Put it to the judges. Um, 
yeah, so it, it was one of those two options mm. in many respects. However, I think in the last three or four years, a couple of companies have, have made inroads in terms of the quality of the. Uh, I scored you on this one, I think. In terms of the, you that for us. In terms of the quality of the of the reels, and Preston is definitely one of them. I mean, that is a fantastic piece of kit. Um, the fact that it can do what we're sort of getting it to do today, i.e., casting, you know, or, or winding back, should I say, um, big weights of, of feeder, and obviously a lot of pressure when it comes to to uh, the fish as well, um, speaks volumes really about the the quality of of the reel. I think I think the big thing with, for me with these is the price range. They're not, you know, you're not talking high end prices, um, but you're getting quality and and i say one of the qualities i like about this is the um the winding power you know dragging five ounces of lead back in all the time mm. is is puts a lot of strain on reels um and that's obviously obviously for its long range um capabilities that obviously helps and uh, i say for the for, for the price I'm, I, I, I'm i'm well impressed with these i mean if i'm honest with with cheap reels in the past i've found two main faults the line lay can be rubbish mm. at times i found that um, you know that that's sometimes it's almost as if the the way that the reel works and lays line on the spool isn't as good on a cheaper um, reel. And the other thing I've sometimes found is you know the mechanism around the bail arm. I.e., mm. sometimes it can have a tendency to open when um, you don't want it to, or um, sometimes you have difficulty it closes up on the cast. But that seems absolutely fantastic. And I know you've used those reels for quite a lot of, of time now. How have you found them as you've been fishing with them? Well, I say, I, I felt them at first. I mean, at first they look a bit they look a bit different because they're obviously a long range reel and you've, they've got the tapered spools, yeah. obviously to aid the cast. And, and I was like, well, am I, are they gonna work on the river? But once I start, once I felt the weight of them, I like a big reel when I'm feeder fishing. You yeah. know, I like that sort of balance on the rod. And um, once I started using them, I, I really like them. The other thing I like as well, and I don't do this on the river, I don't use the drag. But I've started doing it a bit. I still put the back wine on when I'm a bit weird like that, but I find it's got that nice, really yep. nice sound to it, the drag, you know? And I don't know whether sound is a is a, is a reflection of quality, but it doesn't sound it tinny. Sounds nice. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it's like a load of stones rattling in a tin. I know what you mean. And uh, for me, I think it's, uh, well, I've had no problem with it at all, and I, I really like them. And I say, I've used the smaller size one as well, and for, for this sort of thing as well. And it's got, the, they've got the power. And, uh, when you talk there about um, you talk there about the price range on that, and, and that's a massive factor because I mean, I've got friends who uh, I spent upwards of five hundred quid on reels. This reel, I think it's seventy nine quid, isn't it? Yeah. I need a bit more bow in that today. You, you've not got that many friends, have you? Well, no. <laughs> the, the few friends I have got do spend quite a lot of money on reels. Um, but as you say, you know, value for money wise, I think that takes some, that takes some beating. And, and the fact that you're telling me you've used it for a while, because that's the other, the other thing, right? I have found in the past with cheaper reels, yeah, they're fine the first two or three times you go out, but like, like many things, you pay for quality and, um, you know, they can sort of wear out relatively quickly. I know you fish this river a lot. I know it's quite intense fishing. So the fact that you're telling me that it's, uh, it's worked well for you over a period of time, um, is good enough for me. A couple of things I did notice reading up about the reels. First of all, they come supplied with a single handle. I know some anglers like a, a double handle, Dave, but not you. No, I feel I feel you get more. Uh, you get about you know when you're sort of winding big weights and what have you know and sort of from distance and things like. That, I just find a single handle better for me. I don't know what it is. It's just it's preference maybe. I don't know. Maybe it is. I think a lot of um, feeder anglers, you know, on still water reservoirs like a double handle because you don't get that unbalance with the if you have the back wind set or anything mm. like that. And you know, so it always you can always find your, your your position when you're setting your tip. But for me, it's not a problem, and uh, I, I I like the. Uh, I like the big handle, you know, it's got a big handle, something you can get hold of, I've only got small hands. Something you can get hold of, yeah, with yeah. small hands. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, uh, that, that, that's got a good handle on it, so um, yeah, I, I like that, that suits my small little dinky hands, you know. But um, no, they are, and I think, I think what some companies, you know, some of the top high-end reels, companies that you mentioned earlier and things like that, I think where they've got it wrong in the past is when they drop down their, their price range, mm. the quality deteriorates quite a lot. Whereas I think what Preston have been quite clever in what they've done with their reels, they pick a couple of reels 
and 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 they you know they make sure they're right and they put them out there and they and they set out exactly what they are for and the price range they're at. But I think with that in that price range, I think they're punching above their weight with that. Something you said about the rod when we, we, we were sort of talking about that, you said it looks quite a a nice piece of kit. I've got to say that reel looks absolutely fantastic, um, doesn't it? It's a real classy looking piece of kit. You know, the silver flanks, the graphics. Everything about it really, it, um, it looks nice. Big spool, big spool for casting a long way. Dave, I'm, I'm really, really impressed. Mm. I, I, I say, and I, I, you know, on this river, everything gets battered, you know, it's just the way it is. It's everything's, you know, ground, dirt, whatever you throw at it. So it's, you know, it's got to be good to be holding up in, you know, with the strain we put it under. So um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with them. What's in the bag? This is a segment of our show where each episode, Tom and myself will be bringing a secret product in the bag. And we will then discuss. This will be very topical and it will give you a chance, the viewers, to decide what we are discussing on each show. So Dave, what's in the bag this week? Well, Tom, this is actually quite topical and quite topical for this venue mm. because we are talking today about natural venue grain baits. Now, as you know, Tom, this is a venue that kind of eats ground bait. Yeah. Probably, I I struggle to think of another venue that would that where more ground bait is used uh, during the winter months, and it's a, a a topic of discussion that crops up quite a lot on social media and different mixes. So I have bought what I believe is your favourite natural ground bait. One of one of. Okay. And I have bought my favourite natural venue ground bait. Right, okay. Now, what I would say on this is that these ground baits both work on this venue without doubt because there's plenty of people using this, plenty of people using that and people mix things and do things differently but I believe that as long as the mix does what you want it to do then it's fine because these grain baits are not, you know, these they're made by grain bait companies who know what they're putting in grain baits. Um, I don't think there's any great mystery or, or flavour advantage over one to the other. I'm just very happy um, using what I use and I've used that as well before I was ever involved with bait tech. I can't say I entirely agree with what you say. Uh, I do to the extent, to an extent, but the thing to remember, Dave, is average Joe out there um, doesn't necessarily know what he wants his ground bait to do. So mm. it's all very well saying, any ground bait's fine as long as it does what you want it to do, but what do you want it to do? And how do you mix it to make it achieve that? And some ground baits are a lot easier to mix than others. Mm. And some ground baits seem naturally to work in certain situations a lot better than others. Now, what I mean by that, and by the way, both these mixers are very good. Yes, the last few years I've used census ground baits mm. um, pretty exclusively actually, with the exception of, of Van der Nijn Secret, which I sometimes use, and Dynamite Friends of Dent Black, which I often mm. throw I love into. a bit of Secret, by the way. Oh, I used to love using Secret. Great, and it's sticky. And, and I just feel um, there's very few things in fish. I'm quite a simple guy, as you know, very simple guy. Better than us, Tom. Um, but I've definitely found that certain products and certain things it does pay to pay close attention to and it does pay to get them right and ground bait mixes on natural venues is one of those things so i'm going to throw it back at you you say that you like this ground bait because it does what you want it to do mm. on a venue like this you won the match on sunday mm. uh, with what weight was it of roach 53 pounds 53 pound of roach what mix did you use and how did it do what you wanted it to do Okay, well I actually uh, used Pro Natural Extra and uh, a bag of, of normal Pro Natural, which is a slightly, a slightly not as sticky, mm. not, not as binding. Um, the two together mix perfectly and quite often I'll add soil to that. On Sunday I drew quite a shallow peg, mm. so I didn't mix any soil with it at all because I literally wanted that mix to carry a lot of feed, hit the bottom and release. Mm. And that was, you know, having used the grain baits uh, and mixed them and tried different things, I know that was doing a job for me. Um, that's my you know knowing what the grain baits will do for you yeah um and different situations you do and I, I i get what you're saying that people don't always know what that mix is doing it's a minefield it's so confusing you walk in a tackle shop 
And you see, I, I just remember myself as a young angler going, and it's like, wow, all these colours and different things and different companies, all of which you've heard of. And mm. you look through a magazine and you see Darren Bickerton's with Sensus, and he wins plenty of matches. Um, but I think Dennis White was with Vandenheim for a while, and, and he wins loads of matches. And it's sort of, you know, it's quite a, a confusing thing for the average angler. Another question. Um, obviously, you talk about mixing ground baits together. Um, are there any golden rules on that? Do you find that, for example, uh, certain mixers mix together better than others? Or you know, is, is the golden rules, for example, would you happily mix a bag of Gross Gardons with a bag of Pro Natural? Or would you have to mix bait tech ground baits together to...? No, I, I think that there's... Um there's scope for crossover, mm. and I think... Inbreeding, so to speak. Oh, inbreeding of ground baits. <laughs> <laughs> my, my journey with ground bait is, and I'm not someone who I would confess to know lots about ground bait all over the years, but um, the first mix I ever used was a census mix, yep. and then I moved with Bait Tech, and at that time, Bait Tech didn't have Pro Natural, mm. um, so, but they were a distributor of Vandenine, so I used Vandenine, and it took me one week to sort a new mix out because you know what certain ground baits do. At the, yes. Then it was with yes. Vandenine, it was World Champion and Super Roach and it was a beautiful mix on this river and it literally took, first time I used it, caught loads of fish, bingo, game on. And then we, you know, I was involved with the development of Pro Natural um, and we were, it was a great process to be able to sort of say, well, no, that's not quite right. We want this, we want that and, and, and work with it until the finished product came out and so I know it does exactly what I want it to do. Mm. Um, so I can tell you that this is the best ground bait in the world. But the reality is the other three brands of ground bait I've used have worked perfectly well as well. So my point with it is is I don't think it's right to say, well that's that's the magic. Yeah. The magic is not in the ingredients to me. The magic is in the way it works and being able to use it. Absolutely. I, I'm gonna move a bit off topic here, but it sort of reinforces what you're saying in a lot of ways. My one of my first ever features when I worked for uh, Pole Fishing Magazine was Death Ship versus Will Raisin mm. at a shallow um, <coughs> coloured lake down in Surrey somewhere. And um, I got there, I want to learn loads today, can't wait. Mm. And pegs were very similar. Death fish light rigs, little kinder pots, they loose fed. And if you strung out and they, you know, Will, big potted, heavy rigs, bulk down, mm. did everything totally different. And, you know, they're two of the very best anglers in the world absolutely approaching a venue that was both pegs were similar totally totally different it wasn't a, a stage thing it was how they wanted to fish mm. um and i think that sums up what you're saying doesn't it you know mm. in, in that one man's meat is another man's poison when it comes to ground bait there's not necessarily any right or wrong but i do think you want your ground bait to do certain things and yeah. that's a key consideration yeah and i think that the company, the ground bait companies now do put, I mean, they put the information on there, you know, it's it's extra, you know, pro natural extra, gross gardens, it tells you what it does. Um, and I think you can always tell as well, if you look at the ground bait as well, it's worth always, most bags have the little window, yours has the little window on it, you know, yeah. that you can see the bait. And I always find that if you're seeing particles and mixture, that usually means a heavier mix to me. Um, it's the very fine grain baits tend to be the lighter ones um, so that's always a little indicator for me but um, but like I say I don't believe that it's uh, you know that it's some magical ingredient in these grain baits absolutely not oh, I'll stop rambling on at the minute you've got me going on it when your bag this week has, has, has touched the nerve well I knew it would and that's why I did it but um, it's uh, it's a subject that does get discussed and it gets discussed a lot on this yeah. river and I think I feel that people get carried away because of their allegiances and, yeah. I, and I probably shouldn't say this as being being connected to a, a bait company but I think it's right that you are let's be realistic you know and not, don't tell everyone that they, oh, this is the best thing since sliced bread it's a magic to catch in fish it's not that way is it no I think another if you're an angler who struggles to understand ground bait and, and let's be honest none of us have completed our journey with it yet because Next year, the mixing that could change, the mixing that could change. All these ground bait companies are dependent on the suppliers. You know, if mm. they can't get the ingredients, things change. Um, but one thing that I did here on a recent video, which I thought really sort of struck a chord was with Nick Larkin. And he said, it's all very well mixing a ground bait with a drill. Mm. But if you want to really understand how a ground bait works, how it mixes, how it feels, you've got to mix it with your hands. Mm. Yeah. Now, obviously, if you're mixing a lot of ground bait on somewhere like this, you will eventually, you will naturally use it use a drill but the first few times you do it his point was you can feel how it absorbs the water you can feel the sort of texture it makes mm. as you squeeze it together yeah. you can gauge how it's going to break down you can you know take your time take out 
an hour or more if you want on the morning before you leave for the match and mix your ground a bit, feel it, see how it behaves. Um, and I think once you understand or feel you understand mm. what's happening with it, I think that's half the battle, don't you? I do. One question for you. Freezing ground base, okay or not? Not okay. Not okay, Dave. Um, <laughs> not okay. <laughs> I'm of the same opinion. However, I know people who freeze grain bait and do perfectly well with it. But There's I think people about, right? well, well, you'd know. <laughs> but but <laughs> really, <laughs> but what I would say is that I think if if you do go down that route, you've got to be very careful what you do with it when you when you take it out. I don't think it, it, it I don't think it affects the flavours. I think the flavours are, are able to be kept uh, fresh. But I think then you know it's it's the balance of the mix, how it mixes and and what happens to it when it thaws out and things like that. It's, it's that same thing about understanding what you want it to do. I mean, I'd imagine if you froze a, a ground bait, it would totally kill it. So it'd be very inert. Mm. Similar sort of effect to maybe mixing your ground bait the night before. But I mean. I always look at it like a blank canvas. You've got to, if I can, for roach fishing in particular, I like to look at a peg. Mm. Have a look at the colour of the bottom, have a look at you know, what depth it is, and gauge, you know, so you've got a rough idea what you're going to be tackling, and then mix your ground bait and do it accordingly, and, and put some thought into it. You know, it's, there's no formula. You can't just say, mm. this ground bait, this ground bait um, is right for all situations, because, you know, it, it's something that you need to adapt on the day. And I have to say, a bag of ground bait dragged out of the freezer, possibly a little bit lazy. I'd, I'd agree. It's not something I do, but I just, it's something I heard the other day and, and people talking about and some are saying, you know, like you did now. <laughs> no, definitely not. But, not I, okay. but, 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 you know, I'm talking maybe from the sort of, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a cheap product and, I, you know, people like to reuse. So I'm just, uh, I was just asking that question. Well, Dave, you've started something here. I um, have, and we could go on. I've got to tell you that you're going to have to, you're going to be very excited when you find out what's in my bag in the next episode. <coughs> well, I, I genuinely am on this, you know, excited. And um, but I will say at this point that because this is the first one, that you can keep that bag. You're good to me, aren't you? Yeah. Can I keep this one as well? No. Dave, I know how precious you are about the River Wye, so I'm always guarded when I say anything that could potentially become. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll give you that. Um, yeah, it's quite a, a, you know, it's it's it does put a lot of people off. In all fairness, the, the mm. banks of the river. We've, um, you know, we've spent money on platforms and here, but you can't do the whole river. And it is something that if you're coming here regular, you need to be prepared for, mm. and have the right equipment to make yourself safe and, and and be able to get get on the bank and be comfortable. One of the best pieces of tackle I've ever owned. Um, to be honest, is what you sat on there. It's mm. the the op box, and that's what I want to talk about um, for the next item. Mm. Really, this seat box system today, you fished on it. I'm guessing you see a fair few of them on the banks here on the Y. Yeah, definitely. Um, some you know some of the top top anglers who fish here are, are using them now, and um, I have to say, when I first saw them, I was a little bit sort of, you know, what on earth is that? It's you know, it does look like a, a big scaffolding set, but um, when you see them set up and you see anglers fishing with them, you realise that obviously it's, you know, they, they, they seem like a very easy box to get level and stable, um, which is what this is all about, isn't it? It's yeah, yeah, it, it's um, basically there's, there's three models in the range. There's the Opbox D36, which is the most advanced uh, system in the range. That's what you set on at the minute. Complete with the outrigger set, you don't need a platform. That's the beauty of it. You can, you can actually set the box up to be... Um, above knee height if you want to um, so you know any sort of venue where you've got a wade it's perfect for that um, obviously it converts into a, a barra system as well so um, you don't need a platform you don't need a barra it is an integrated seat box system um, at the end of the day mm. what are your thoughts on it having having sort of fished on it today what do you think i think it's it's nice and nice and stable um i say i've always gone down the route of sort of a platform in the water and a light seat box yeah um this isn't a venue where we lose use a lot of long pole uh, you know rarely yeah. so it, it's kind of never necessary to have a foot plate for me yeah um but this is this is very stable um you know you've got everything around me it's obvious that it's well thought out and um I feel safe. Yeah. That's the biggest thing is I can sort of, you know, my fishing is very much about sort of being up and down on the river. You float fishing, you're up, you're down, you're looking for your float, that sort of thing. And I find, 
you know that's that's where it can be dangerous if you're on the slippy bank so this certainly we've you know fished on this all day and i think it's you know it's, it's not moved it's brilliant yeah uh, and that, that's one of the great things about it all the products in the range there's the opbox d25 which is um more you can get the outrigger set for it but it's more suited to commercial anglers obviously smaller legs mean mm. less i won't say less stability but i think naturally uh, thicker legs do bend less or move less mm. uh, there's less movement in them uh, and there's also a canal stall in there for want of a better way of putting it. that's the Opbox compact system so three products in the range there um, did I see that they do a, an electronic trolley now as well to go with it yes that's coming in very very soon if it's um, a whole thing with Opbox obviously I've sort of worked with the company quite closely um, the whole thing is evolving um, they used to do it Mark 1, Mark 2, and I think by 2012 they're up to about Mark 13, so I don't know whether they've stopped doing that. Now. Right, okay. But um, yeah. th that gives you an idea of how everything he does, he, you know, Rick Tyler, who's a man behind it, he evolves, he changes something, he tweaks yeah. something, and the next year's is better. The electric trolley system, I know last year a lot of anglers loved it, but he wasn't happy with it. Um, mm. There were a few uh, things about it to do with the size of the gearbox um, okay. and the torque, basically, of the wheels that he wasn't happy with. So he's changed it, and that's coming out very very soon i mean finally it's worth saying the d36 system and the electric trolley they're not cheap you know you, you a thousand pounds worth there roughly when you take everything into account but this is this is an argument i've had with, with people before ultimately we spend five hours of a match sitting on this and however many times a week you do that whether it's once or three or four or five times um you know we, this is our you know our backs our safety so you know you've you got to look at what you're investing in mm. so i think if it's if it's doing a job um then all well and good i mean uh, it feels it's felt safe as as houses today i've sat on it all day i mean but you know a way flight figure like me it's gonna is it is it is it is it, is it still sturdy with well, a heavier person on it or is it? the juggernaut that is tom scholar they can tell you yeah. it's very substantial but oh. the good thing about me is you know with a lot of weight around the back end i'm quite quite well grounded on a seat box i have to tell you that a bit light up top though eh? a bit light up top how rude. Um, any negatives at all? Anything you don't like? Um, I think setting up would probably be, um, it's not tight, it's simple enough to set up, I can see that, but it's the fact I'd have to set it up. That's for me is sometimes a negative when I just want to, you know, I've got my own, I'm used to using light boxes and platforms. Instead of a stool, you, you literally, it's four legs, that's it, isn't it? Well, yes. I mean, if, if it had three, it would be even better. Milk, a milking stool <laughs> but uh, no it's it, that's that's always the way I've been so it's it's just taking time out of that setup and quite often on the river you have a, a long walk and things like that but ultimately you've got to be safe when you get there and if you're someone that needs to sit down for five hours then uh, you know I, I feel that this is a definitely a, a, a worthwhile investment awesome what about the accessories it's got lots of accessories with it. There was a feeder arm and, and these, this back tray, this is a useful thing. Absolutely. It? I mean, tray wire. Rick Tyler always sort of sums it up by saying, um, with the Opbox, you can do any number of things with it. It's about adapting it to what you want it to do. So it's feeder arms. One of my favourite features is the bump bar. You'll notice at the front of the foot plate, there's an extension arm. That comes out. You can mount a bump bar um, up to about a metre in front of where you can with any other system. I've seen that. And, so, and that makes you more stable. But also it's nice, you know when you're river fishing, you top fives or whatever, and you're mm. looking fish, I often, getting a bit lazy maybe, but I'll unhook a fish, I'll unhook a fish drop the top five on the, on the rest, mm. and it's, everything's just easy. Mm, yeah. um, so there is, there's, there's, a, there's bump bars, feeder arms, obviously trolley kit I mentioned, um, the outrigger kit which you've got on there for extra stability. Um, but if you want to, and I, I use my mate Nick Speed as an example, he just fishes Lindo, or commercials um, mainly, he stripped it right back. He literally took, the, took all the legs out. It's like a, a skeleton of a box that he uses for commercial fishing. So that, that pretty much tells you everything you need to know about the system. It's as advanced um, or as simple as you want it to be. Um, but I do take your point on a venue like this, because you're going to want the adaptability mm. of the, of, of the, of the you know, blending the box into the bank. Um, you would need probably the outrigger system and obviously the side trays as well. I think one thing is is that it's it's just not a conventional seat box. So I think that for me at first was it was a bit it almost uh, you know you just look at it and it doesn't it's not what your your brain is trained to look. You know yes. we expect to sort of seat boxes you know, your reeves and God knows what and um, and it doesn't look like that. So automatically your 
it's different, isn't it? So yeah. it takes you a while to get, and then it's when you see people using them, you go, actually, yeah, that looks like a really good bit of kit. So um, I think it's nice. It's to it is totally different. It's not trying. They're not trying to copy anything. They've got their their model, and like you say, they're evolving all the time. So I think quite impressed. Well, I'm very glad you like it. Are you going to try and catch me some roach now? I'll try. I'll try. I can't promise. Let's have so a go. I don't. I don't let everyone into my little secrets. Little secrets. Mm. I don't think I want to be let into your little secrets. <laughs> Well, Dave, there we have it. A good day on the River Wye. Not what the river can produce on some days, but considering a lot of extra snow water coming down, I don't think we can be too disappointed, can we? No, nope. it's um, what we expected, really. I did, you know, I just hope we get it a bite, got a bite first to start with, and we did that. A couple of barbel, and um, yeah, it's been really good, hasn't it? Really interesting. Um, obviously, uh, the aim of the game today was to review some tackle. Um, I want to start by asking you your thoughts in conclusion on the 13 foot Guru distance feeder. Firstly, what are your thoughts? Because when you turned up here this morning, you said to me, I can't believe you fish the river when it's like this. So were you thinking that maybe we'd bitten off more than we can chew for the, for, for the size of the river? Absolutely. I've never fished a river like this mm. before. Um, if I'd have turned up today, not know, you know, without you, mm. I'd have been pole feeding it off the end of the rod or, or fishing it on the inside mm. in the steadier water. And then obviously you've proceeded to chuck a feeder bigger than I've ever used, mm. right out into the middle of the, of the river. Well, um, that, that, that was what was the, the impressive thing for me, was the way that, uh, the way that rod casts. You know, it's, it's obviously, you know, it's designed as a casting rod and it casts. And it, that was, you know, a five ounce feeder and it was sailing, you know, we could have thrown to the far bank if we wanted to. Um, so that was brilliant for me, the way, it, um, the way it handled the weight winding in and that, the way the rod um, reacted to the current and things like that, and then to, a, a, you know, an angry barbel on the end. All right, not the biggest barbel, but barbel or barbel, they pull. And, um, and isn't that current as well, Dave? I mean, yeah. to absorb the lunges and everything else. It felt, you felt, always felt in control. So I have to say, I was impressed. If I was to improve it in any or if it was to be a specialist tool for the river for me i'd like to see a 14 foot version because i think a 14 foot version in that would be perfect right, okay. um but um but yeah it really it ticked all the boxes it did it did a great job for us today awesome um obviously i got to have a go with the uh, preston reel um and as i said i was a bit skeptical uh, mm. i've always been a dio reel man myself um i've got friends who use shimano's and are very impressed and it's always concerned me a little bit that maybe other companies don't have the same technology, don't have the same um, reputation when it comes to, to reels. And to be honest, in my days uh, reviewing tackle, I saw some pretty mediocre mm, yeah. efforts from other co companies. Um, but that is a fantastic piece of kit. I'd go as far as to say value for money wise, mm. it's probably one of the best reels I've seen. And the thing that's impressed me the most, if you don't mind me saying, is the fact that you tell me you've used it for quite a while and it's as good now as it was when you first got it. Yep, that, for, for me that's the key, is that it's winding that five ounce feeder in all the time. Maybe, how many casts have we had today? A hundred, maybe not that many, I don't know. But it's doing that all the time and that's so much pressure on the gearing and uh, all the cogs and everything mm. and it's just... It's never. It's as good as it was when when I had it new. So, absolutely. Um, I mean, and, and I think it's punching above its weight for its for its price tag. Um, I think you know it's it's good. And I like what Preston are doing with their reels now. I think they've really sort of upped their game, and um, they're bringing genuine you know genuine top end reels at good prices. Absolutely. No. Really impressed with that. And finally, I asked you to uh, have a sit on the Opbox uh, D36. Um, just some conclusions on that. Yep, absolutely. I mean, it's probably the best box I've ever seen for levelling up, you know, for, for, to, to actually get yourself on a stable platform where you can sit all day and you could fish long pole, you know, where you need a foot plate. Um, like I say, on this river, I tend not to. I'm sort of more of a, a you know, a nice light box, just 
get it on the bank somehow and get you know as long as you're safe you're fine but for that setting up in a few fish natural venues like this where you need um natural i, I, I don't think there's a better box on the market to be honest um probably not a, uh, whether i'd buy one now i don't know because it just because you get set in your ways don't you and i have Absolutely. my preferred way and unfortunately like you said about this venue the banks are um they are treacherous and you you've got to do what you feel safe and just for, from from my point of view for setting up time and just feeling safe i like to sort of keep it minimal stuck in your ways like very much it's comes older, with, it comes you? with age it, it comes with age but um but yeah but I, I like it i do like it and i think what they've done it that what they're doing with that is something totally different to other box designs and i can see why i'm seeing top anglers come in here and they're using them and i can see why so good product excellent well folks i hope you've enjoyed our first day out our first review if you like what you see on this video it's really really important that you give it a like give it a share if you would tell your friends about it because what we're going to try and do is do a lot more of these basically get out to different venues uh, test different tackle and bring you the honest opinions of two unsponsored anglers um, and hopefully they'll be a benefit to you and your fishing I think I think that's it. What we're trying to deliver is 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 honesty and, and a genuine review, not because we're paid to do it, but because we can do it and because we've got a different opinion. So I think um, hopefully we'll have lots of interesting products to, to testing in in the coming episodes. And um, where are you going to take me to next? I've 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 had my day on the Y now. Where are you going to take me to a commercial or something? Well, we'll definitely take you north of Sheffield, mate. Now I've come all this way. Mm. Hey, you better get used to it. Yorkshire puddings for breakfast. Where I come from. It's all right, that. Do I need a passport? Uh, you won't need a passport. Yeah. You might need to smart yourself a bit, though. I don't know if Patagonia stuff. <coughs> well, we'll see. You want to have a pint? Let's do that. Come on.